Hey everybody, if I was to talk about chapter 47 and chapter 48 as a ride in Disneyland, I would say it's Toad's Wild Ride. This is an amazing system. I want to get you started on the first chapter and then we'll go to the next chapter. I hope you find it quite as amazing as I do. So let's go. All right, I want to start out reading the lesson plan because I think it's important that you know what I want you to learn. What, what do we get out of this chapter? Well, it's to identify the data to be collected for the nursing assessment of the patient with the endocrine disorder. So we're going to learn about assessing the patient. And that's what I want you to think about as you read the chapter as well. Also, describe the tests and procedures. Now, I'm going to go through some, not all. Um, but used to diagnose disorders of the endocrine system and related nursing care. Identify the cases, the classes, sorry, of drugs used to treat the endocrine disorders. So I'll go through some of those drugs. Uh, yeah, I know I'm not a pharm class, but nonetheless, this will help you in your pharm class because we're going to learn about some drugs. Describe the nursing responsibilities when administering these drugs. So let's get started. So what are the functions and regulation of hormones? Well, they're released in response to body's needs. As your body needs something, these hormones are released. Organs and the endocrine system and the pituitary, they all release hormones that we need. So they are responsible for reproduction, fluid and electrolyte balance, host defenses, responses to stress and injury, <clears throat> energy metabolism, and growth and development. Most important, I'd say, is the endocrine system maintains homeostasis, or balance. And the way it does that is that it does by negative feedback, which I find most amazing, because what your body is, is missing, the hormones are released. So I know that your book uses the thermostat as a um, thermometer, so to speak, of what negative feedback is. So I want you to read that. Try to understand how that means that when, when the temperature goes low or high, right, the thermostat will kick on to make it more equal or more comfortable for you. So as the heat rises, maybe the air conditioner pops on and cools off the temperature. So that's the way negative feedback works. And then for positive feedback, high levels are stimulated. So high, in some cases, high levels of something stimulate a response. And in other instances, low levels inhibit a response. So very amazing. Now here's a picture of your pituitary. It is attached to the hypothalamus that's up in the brain. So it's way inside the head. And you notice that there's the ovaries, the testes, the thyroid, the adrenal glands. They all secrete a hormone to the pituitary, or let's say the pituitary releases a hormone and then the adrenals respond with cortisol I'm looking at adrenals right now, but you notice that the red arrows is what the pituitary is releasing, and then the black arrows is what the adrenals are releasing. And then if you look at the adrenal thyroid testes and ovaries, what they secrete into the body. Another example of our feedback mechanisms and homeostasis. Now I put this slide in here, I thought it was interesting, because it's a cross section of the adrenal gland. So it can show you that cortex or the outer core of the adrenal gland and what's released there, glucocorticoids. And then the medulla, which is the inner part, what is released there. So I want you to take a peek at that and I'm gonna get talking about some more of those things. But this is an example of how things are released by the adrenal gland. Right, here's another example. 
Nothing like repeating myself, right? Pituitary gland has an anterior portion and a posterior portion that releases hormones. Then the adrenal glands, as we just saw, has uh, the medulla, which stimulates catecholamines, which is our fight or flight responses. And then the cort cortex releases steroids. And we know we've talked about steroids in the immune response, but steroids also do some other things uh, for our body, which we're going to talk about, uh, such as mineral corticoids that maintain volume in our body, which helps relate to our kidneys, aldosterone, angiotensin, ADH, and then the glucocorticoids, which is our cortisol or our cortisone. And then our thyroid gland and our parathyroid gland. And then our pancreas is also an endocrine and exocrine gland. The endocrine gland, it, it has two, two functions really. Um, as far as the exocrine gland, it secretes, um, well, you tell me. Think about it. What does it release? Digestive hormones. Okay, good job. All right, here's a picture of our thyroid gland. And you can see we've got, it's right in the neck. Um, and there's a right side and a left side, or a lobe, right lobe, left lobe, connected by isthmus. And that's at the bottom of this picture, you can see. And you can see where it is in relation to our hyoid bone and our laryngeal prominence. So we can kind of feel where that is. And sometimes you see people's thyroids are enlarged and you can actually see like a goiter type of a situation in the neck. So let's talk about the thyroid gland. Well, it has two lobes, as we saw, connected by the isthmus. It regulates the body's rate of metabolism and growth. And uh, the hormones that it produces, um, the thyroid, thyroxine and t or t4 it also releases triodothyronine which is t3 it also releases calcitonin which is secreted when serum calcium levels are high limiting the shift of calcium from the bones into the blood okay now our parathyroid glands little guys uh, they function independently of the thyroid and they secrete only one hormone the parathyroid hormone and it regulates the serum calcium level now we know calcium is essential in strong bones and plays a role in the function of nerve and muscle cells but let me ask you this what does a drop in calcium trigger in the nerves well maybe you've heard of tetany tetany is um, a lack of calcium in the nerves. It's, it almost causes a seizure-like activity. Tetany, we'll learn more about that. Uh, a drop in serum calcium triggers parathyroid hormone, and the PTH increases absorption of calcium from the intestines and transfers calcium from the bones to the blood if it's needed in the blood. Uh, it signals kidneys to conserve calcium and balance phosphorus loss. Now, what are some age-related changes that occur? So in healthy older adults, endocrine function remains adequate. Now, I find that kind of an interesting statement because um, it remains adequate. It doesn't mean it's perfect. It's just adequate. So we see it's diminished response to ADH. So there is a little, little decrease, right? But it's not so much that it overwhelms the body. Declines in growth hormone, decline in cortisol secretion, decline in aldosterone secretion, and the incidence of hypothyroidism increases with age, especially among women. Darn it. I wanted to keep up the energy. All right, so let's turn to assessment on page 920, if you would, please. I know you're hearing my pages turn. 
because I want to go through this with you really well. So page 920, box 47.1. Now I know it's also in the pages, but this is a quick summary. So if we go through the health history, we want to find out, first of all, why are they here? What brings them to our facility? And then we want to know what's their present health or history of present illness. So have they had any loss of energy, weight gain or weight loss? Has their height changed? How about their skin? Has their skin changed in color? Um, sexual function, urinary function, too much urine, too little urine. And then what color is the urine? These are all questions we always want to talk about. We want to talk about their past health history. Now I know I'm being brief on some of these, so just read them thoroughly, but I'm just going to give you a quick um, importance. Diabetes, does that run in the family? Or did, did you have it? A brain tumor? Any head trauma or central nervous system problems? Vascular disorders? Renal disorders? And then the family history again, diabetes. Does it run in the family? Maybe you don't have it, but somebody in your family does. Thyroid disease. And when you take these histories from your patients, I want you to be asking yourself, okay, well, renal problems run in your family. What could you be seeing in your patient then? Are you seeing any kidney dysfunctions? So be thinking, this is, this is critical thinking. You, you're given an idea and then you expand on that in relation to your patient. All right, sorry, I know I'll get off subject sometimes, but I, I feel that it's important. So let's still talk about then review of systems, and we're talking about urine. So too much, too little, the color, the osmolarity, the vision. Do you, do you have more blurred vision? Or how about exophthalmus? Do you notice that when you're looking at your patient? Remember, that's the bulging of the eyes. And then are they weak? Do they feel weak? Do they feel tired? And then their functional assessment. So are they sleeping okay? How much alcohol are they drinking? Have they had any changes in appetite? This is their function every day to day function. All right, so our physical exam then is going to be taking their height and weight, their vital signs. Their blood pressure is really important. We've learned about pulse pressure, so you want to notice the difference between the diastolic and systolic can tell you something. Is their blood pressure high? Are they on medication? Are they, um, do they have orthostatic hypotension? When they stand up, does their blood pressure change? These can all point to diseases, so it's important to know. Their skin, what's the color? Is it pale? Is it pink? Does it have a golden tone? Are there bronze stainings? Are there red blotches? Is there petechiae? So you want to look at the body. The texture, is it smooth? Um, there is some diseases here we're going to talk about where they lose hair. So the texture of the skin, is it, is it um, wrinkly? Is it smooth? Do have, they have edema? They have pitting edema. We'll move on to the face and neck. Are there prominent features? Again, their eyes, exophthalmus. Their forehead, is it prominent? Is there a broad structure across their nose and face? Um, then we move on to the trunk of their body. So we look at the front and we see, is there some obesity there? Is it in relationship to the rest of their body? Is all their body obese or just their trunk? And then is there striae? And if you remember, striae are the red streaks on the abdomen. And then on the back are their fat pads. 
Do they have like almost a hump? My mom used to call it a dowager's hump, but uh, I can also call it a buffalo hump on the back, which we'll find is indicative of certain diseases. Then uh, we want to look at their reflexes, their range of motion. Do they have crepitus when you move their arms around? or when If they can move their extremities, great. You can evaluate that. How good of range of motion do they have forward, backwards, and check their uh, joints. Then their neurological reflexes. I know we don't usually check those, but there's a couple that are interesting here in this system, and that's Chavostic and Trousseau. Now, you don't need to know this particularly for this exam, but I will tell you, you need it for NCLEX. We go over it in NCLEX and be more specific about that in relationship to what it means. So, uh, Chavostic, and it's in your book, there's a picture there. A Chavostic sign is the facial twitch. So, you're tapping their cheek, which is a facial nerve, and it causes a twitching. And then the trousseau sign is the blood pressure cuff. You pump up the cuff, and what you'll see is the hand starts to curl in and twitches. These are neurological reflexes that mean there's a disease. So here's a picture, signs of hypocalcemia, the Chavostic sign and the Trousseau sign. Chavostic, the face twitch, the Trousseau, the, um, sorry, lost my place. Uh, trousseau is the blood pressure. Now let's look at some diagnostic tests and procedures that are important. Now remember this is introduction. So I'm just introducing some basics right now and I'll get into the diseases in the next chapter. So let's turn to page 916 and look at some diagnostic tests. So we see, um, it's a, I know table 47.1 is long, but it's on page uh, 914. 914 and I want you to get to 916 specifically but it does start in 914 um, thyroid studies so we know about CT scans we know about MRIs we talk about those in every chapter and how you always if they're going to get dye you need to check and be sure if they're allergic to anything but the thyroid scan, so let's look at that. It's at the bottom of the page, 916. Thyroid scan is given orally, and a scanner is used to detect the, the pattern of uptake by the thyroid gland. So interesting that this technesium that you swallow goes directly to the thyroid. It knows exactly where to go. My dad always used to say, and he'd look at his handful of pills and he'd go, how do they know where to go? And it is pretty amazing, isn't it? When you think about how does the medicine know where to go? How does this thyroid uh, technesium that you swallow, how does it know where to go? Well, it does. They, they make it that way. So it's sensitive to certain organs or tissues. All right. Sorry. Um, so... What's important about the thyroid scan then is look under patient preparation. So it says, tell the patient an isotope will be given and scans performed afterwards. Um, for the scan, the patient must lie still on his back for 20 minutes. Sometimes that's hard for people. But what you need to remember here is the patient should not consume iodine. Iodine is in the dye already. So it could give a false negative positive, right? So what what is iodine in? Well, some fish. Iodine is in um, some salt, iodized salt. I hope they don't salt their food that much or it would affect the procedure. But um, again, we want to tell the patient, not to consume iodine. So there's some lab studies on page uh, table 47.1 also. 
that I wanted you to notice. And if you go over to the next page, which is by, uh, 917, it just talks about uh, the T3, the T4, the thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, it talks about parathyroid hormone, calcium, phosphate. These are all lab tests uh, that are drawn that tell the doctor what could be going on with the patient when they present with certain symptoms. So on page 922 is the drug therapy table. So let's look at that. So the first one I want you to look at is under, we have the ADH preparations. D, D, A, V, P. That's dexomesopressin. Notice it says pressin. It's a nasal spray. It can be given parenteral or oral. It treats diabetes insipidus. Some other things as well. But I want you to know that uh, the DDAVP, uh, desopressin, nasal spray for ADH, antidiuretic. All right, also look at the pituitary hormone, suppressants. And that is sandostatin. Sandostatin suppresses the secretion of growth hormone. It's going to be important in some of the diseases we talk about in the next chapter. It's used to treat acromegaly, sandostatin. Now, I'll tell you something interesting about sandostatin. The other name for that is octreotide, if you notice. And you know how some drugs do two things depending on how they're given or when they're given? Well, octreotide is given IV for gastrointestinal bleeding. Interesting. But sandostatin, in this instance that I want you to know about, I just, you know, knowledge is power, so I just want you to know more information. But sandostatin suppresses the secretion of the growth hormone or acromegaly. Okay, uh, there's some adrenal hormones, uh, glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids. And if you're following with me through the pages here, we'll get to the thyroid hormone. I know you know the antifungal agent. It's always ends in oral, uh, ketona, ketonazole, nazarol. Uh, the thyroid hormone. So levothyroxine or synthroid. Maybe you've given it to some of your patients. Maybe you know someone who takes that. So synthroid main, is maintained on the same brand name product to avoid fluctuations in blood levels. So you, what that means is the patient is always given the same amount and the level in the blood is drawn to be sure they're getting the correct amount of Synthroid. So if you move over to nursing interventions on this Synthroid, it says older patients are more susceptible to toxicity. This is why we draw blood levels, because we want to see, is that patient getting too much Synthroid? And you may notice a change in their behavior. Are they hyper? Are they acting differently? So this is when you're, again, critical thinking comes in. You notice a change. What is the change from? So become a detective and find out why are they acting differently. Okay. So, nursing interventions, look over here on Synthroid. Contraindicated during pregnancy. Oops, I did it. Oops, I did it again. Go down to the next one. I already lectured on Synthroid, so let's get to Tapazole. Tapazole is an antithyroid drug. 
And I want you to notice the contraindications here or the nursing interventions for tapazol. It's contraindicated during pregnancy. Monitor for bleeding, liver toxicity. Liver toxicity, hmm. So think about liver toxic. What happens when the liver gets toxic? Jaundice, abdominal pain, malaise. Liver does so many things, and if it gets toxic, you're going to see some presentations. Maybe their abdomen starts getting bigger. So also, it's given for hypothyroidism. We want to watch out, excuse me, not given for. Our nursing intervention, we're going to watch for hypothyroidism. And that would be weight gain, fatigue. Tell the patient to report any of these signs and symptoms to the healthcare provider. So if I confused anybody there for a second, I'm sorry, uh, go to the antithyroid drug Tepazol and note the nursing intervention, contraindicated for pregnancy, and also check your patient for hypothyroidism. Symptoms would be weight gain, fatigue, and tell the patient to report any of those things to the physician. Then if you go to the next page, which is page 925. <laughs> I have trouble seeing, I think. Um, the iodides. The iodides. S-S-K-I. Saturated solution of potassium iodide. So, know that drug. And know what the nursing intervention is. Because it can stain teeth. You know, we've talked about another drug that stains teeth, and that was iron. Well, SSKI can stain the teeth. It's under nursing interventions. Um, so have them use a straw if they take it. That's important to know. Then there's also some drugs for um, hypoparathyroidism, drugs for diabetes, oral, diabetic meds, hypoglycemics, which you know about. And also on the next page, um, it talks about insulin also. Okay. Now, we're done with that chapter, but I want you to read the key points because I think they're important in this chapter. So negative feedback is really important. High levels of a substance inhibit hormone synthesis and secretion whereas low levels stimulate hormone synthesis and secretion. So I want you to understand the negative feedback because it's going to help you understand what's going on in some of these disease processes. Positive feedback, high levels of a substance that stimulates hormone synthesis and secretion. Now I know positive feedback is what we give our patients and we give our children, we give our students, but this is something different. This is what the body does. Uh, the anterior pituitary secretes um, growth hormone, ACTH, thyroid stimulating hormone, FSH, LH, prolactin, and uh, MSH. And then the posterior, remember we have both sides of the pituitary, Posterior pituitary only secretes two things, ADH and oxytocin. Now, um, if you just going to skip down for a minute to aldosterone is the primary mineral corticoid that plays a key role in maintaining an adequate extracellular fluid volume. Renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone are vital to restoring and maintaining intravascular volume. We talked about this with the kidneys. Glucocorticoids control carbohydrates, lipids, and fat responses, metabolism, regulate anti-inflammatory and immune responses, and controls emotional states. Hmm. The thyroid gland plays a major role in regulating the body's rate of metabolism and growth and development. Parathyroid 
which is secreted by the parathyroid gland, plays a critical role in regulating serum calcium levels. Remember our chivastic and our trousseau. The nursing assessment of the patient with an endocrine disorder is very comprehensive because of the many systemic responses of endocrine diseases. So I'm going to stop here and then we'll pick up with the next chapter.